Please join me in welcoming Noni Gadsden this morning. Good morning, everybody. I'm thrilled to be here, and thank you for coming. Um, some, uh, did you all get the handout that I uh, put? Great. And so I asked some questions at the top of that handout. And if you haven't gotten it, I think they have some more up at the top of the, uh, the stairs. Um, but questions like, why did a tax on tea spark a revolution? What did tea drinking mean to the colonial households in early America? How can we learn from household objects to tell us about American history, or history in general? And as uh, Kristen read in my, my CV, I am a, not an art historian. Shh, don't tell anybody. I work, in an art, I work in a fine arts museum, but I'm not an art historian. I studied American studies and material culture. And that's what I'm going to give you a little insight into today. This um, course was created, as, as Kristen said, to celebrate the recent publications of two MFA Spotlight books. And these are a series of small books in which the author explores the stories behind one object. It's all, all you can think about, sort of looking at 360 degree view on one object. One of these being Jerry Ward's book on Paul Revere's Liberty Bowl, and the other being Elliot Davis's book on Thomas Sully's enormous painting, Washington Crossing the Delaware. And both books will give you a deep dive into what each work of art can tell you about the people and the culture who created it. And this kind of study, this deep dive and looking at all angles, is right up my alley. So when I was asked to give a lecture as part of this series, I thought it might be helpful to talk a little bit about how we read objects and how you can lose objects to learn about history. Sometimes people find that a little bit more intimidating than looking at paintings for the same way. So this whole concept is called the study of material culture. So today, I am going to give you sort of a definition of material culture studies and use a, bio, a biographical uh, study and a story about myself, about how I got into this to give you sort of some background on what material cultural studies is. And then a few examples about how objects can give us insight into the American Revolution. All right, so let's get started. Okay, what is material culture? Uh, material culture is a relatively young field. Um, it was best described and defined in 1982 by one of my college professors, Jules Prown, in his article, Mind in Matter, An Introduction to Material Culture Theory and Method, which is also on your bibliography. Material culture is the study through artifacts of the beliefs, the values, ideas, attitudes, and assumptions of a particular community or society at a given time. Material culture is the object-based study of the study of culture. And it's exploration into the patterns of belief and behavior. So we work from the objects themselves to see what they can tell us, rather than using the objects as illustrations of an idea. Explores both the intrinsic and the emotional values of objects as well as the more, as, and is a, often seen as a more representative of a larger proportion of society. Because sometimes you'll have paintings from a certain level of society, but these objects can tell you about maybe the people who made them, the, the people who own them, and different levels of society that we don't have written documents about. Studying objects of the past can re reveal just as much about our own society and our own cultural values and that's one of the, th the tricky things about material culture studies is not projecting your own values onto an object and trying to keep your own biases out of that um, study. So being aware is the most important part. Material culture methodology is in three parts, description, deduction, and speculation. Description is simple. You start with the object. You record the physical evidence of the object, trying to be without a bias or assumption. So uh, you can look at the object and see what it can show, tell you about its size, its weight, its materials, its construction methods, trying to make no leaps or assumptions of conclusions. And I remember Professor Prown taking us through this, and it was ad nauseum. What do you see there? I see a woman. How do you know it's a woman? Well, I see some triangles. What is the triangle? It's just taking it through, but really getting you to look at the object 
And one of the best ways for me to do this is to sit down and try to sketch the object. It really makes you look at it. I can't sketch. I'm horrible. I, you know, I study art. I don't do it. But it, ha it makes me look at the object very carefully. The next step is deduction, um, interpreting the interaction between the object and the viewer. So what would it be like to use this object, to interact with it? Um, or if it's a representation, what would it be like to be transported empathetic, em empathetically into the depicted world? What would it be like to be in that painting? What, how would you feel that using that chair, using that teapot? It must be rate, your, your ideas must be based on a, reasonable, a reasonableness and common sense, so not making too much deduction, but something that would be understood by the vast majority of people. And this is through sensory engagement, or if it's in a museum, imagined sensory engagement, and intellectual engagement. What was it used for? Um, and your emotional response to the object. And then taking all of this information, you go to speculation, and you create hypotheses and questions which lead from the object to external evidence for further study. So not until the third stage do you start saying, OK, well, it's a really comfortable chair. Why was it important that this chair was comfortable? Why did I, why, why, what, what does that mean to the chair? Were there other chairs that were less comfortable in this community? Why was this one considered comfortable? So starting to ask those questions. So taking these theories, um, using the evidence to create an interpretive role, to, to reveal um, cultural perspectives that relate to today, as well as divergent perspectives that try to relate to the time. And then taking those theories and testing them with research, trying to find out more about the period. And that is when you bring in all sorts of other disciplines, from archaeology to cultural anthropology, social history, folklore, art history, even psychology and linguistics. This makes me sound like I'm really, really smart. It's, that's not, not the case. This is a lot of highfalutin talk for a way of really looking at objects and having the objects lead the study. So let's get on to an example. This chair was one of my first student assignments my junior year at Yale University when I was taking a course called Material Culture and Domestic Architecture of the 18th Century under Professor Ned Cook. And some of you may remember Ned. He was a, 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 a curator here back in the 80s and early 90s. He left here to go teach at Yale where he found me. Um, we were given a list of different uh, pieces of furniture that we were told to go look at this furniture study the piece and see what you can find out about it, and then, then create a, t a story about it based on the evidence the piece gives you. And this, the story is not a fictional story, but create a, a true, the, the, what this piece can tell us about history. So I chose this chair since it was sort of funny looking and different from most chairs I'd seen before. I also liked its name. It's called a roundabout chair. What does that mean? Who used it? And I wanted to find out. So this is all the information I had when I, was get, when I was given. The name, the date, the location made, the materials, and the credit line, how it came into the Yale collection. I was warned, however, not to assume that any of this information was true and to make sure that the object proved to me that the information was true. My first step was to examine the object and describe it. So I went to the furniture study with my paper and pencil and was given a flashlight, and I crawled around on the floor. And to walk you around, uh, walk you through this, I've taken pictures of a closely related roundabout chair here in the MFA collection to give you a sense of how I proceeded. Forgive me for getting to take a picture of the chair with the um, actual seat in it. Uh, I, I apologize for that. Did I? Here we go. Um, it it um, was an oversight. But you can imagine that it had a seat like the one before. These are called slip seats that are removable seats. So what did I see? I saw a chair, and I measured its dimensions. How tall was it? How high was the seat, et cetera? I saw wood, actually two kinds of wood, one making up the frame and the other, other wood on the unseen parts of the piece, i.e. in here. At the time, I didn't know enough about woods to confirm what kind of woods I was looking at, um, and I needed to get external evidence to help me with that. <clears throat> 
I saw a chair with a square seat and four legs, three of which were one shape, round and tapered with a small pad foot. And then while the fourth, which was in the front, which was something unusual to me, uh, was a bold, rounder, and more substantial and more prominent leg. Let me see if I can get a... I guess this gives you a bit of a sense. Here's the more bolder leg that really is in the front of the chair. The rails of the seat, or the skirt, were cut into and had arches in them. The top blocks of the rear three legs served as the connection points. This is one piece of wood. So all of these were uh, posts. And the, the, there were, um, the two spaces between the rear posts were filled with a flat-shaped splat of wood. On the top of the two-piece armrest, there was a crest rail holding the armrest together. I knew some of the basics of construction at the time, but now I know a little bit more. Uh, I could tell that these pieces were mortise and tenon together and then had pins to secure the mortise and tenon, and that means there was a, t a tongue that went into a hole, a receiving hole. So one piece of wood was slotted into this um, hole in the other, and then pins were put in from the outside to secure it, and that's called a mortise and tenon which is a generally a more traditional mode of carpentry. Nowadays, very few things have such old construction methods. Uh, they go for a cheaper dowel methods or so forth, or nails. The rounded elements on the rear legs were turned on a lathe. I could see that here, because they were, they were completely round. And the curve, but the curving elements, such as the back splat and so forth, would have had to been carved out. So I saw that there were different uh, methods of construction here as well. So then I decided to move on uh, into deduction. How did it relate to my body? It was a little short, and it seemed to little sit a little low. How would I sit in it? Where would my legs go? Is that very comfortable? I really didn't think I could sit up straight in this chair. The seat was too deep for me to have a back, uh, my back straight against the splat and still allowed my legs to bend to touch the floor. So no matter what angle I imagine sitting in it. The proportions of the skirt, its depth, seemed a little unlike what I was used to. It seemed big in comparison to the crest rail. Then, it was go then what was going on under the slip seat? On this piece, you can see these iron braces have been put in uh, to uh, support the piece that when it was starting to have some trouble st uh, stability-wise. Those certainly didn't seem original, given the mortise and tennis construction. And what's up with this extra strip of wood? I could see it was old. It had rose-headed or handmade nails holding it on that had a lot of oxidation or color to them. So I knew that strip had been there a long time, but there doesn't seem to serve any purpose. And it ran all the way around the seat. The slip seat sat here up here, so it wasn't for the slip seat. I examined the removable slip seat. In this example, it had a needle pulled upholstery on the slip seat, which seemed nice, but when I looked at the underside, it was where it was tacked on the wooden frame, there were lots of other nail holes, so I could tell that there was another kind of upholstery there originally. How was I supposed to sit in this chair, and why was it made in such an unusual shape? Did it have a particular use? What was the original upholstery on this chair? So taking all of these questions, I sought out external evidence. I looked into catalogs and other collections to see what were examples of this roundabout form. There were many, and it seems to have started in the Queen Anne period of the 1720s and be popular through the 18th century with a few versions of the form being made well into the 19th century such as the one on the right here. I found this period image of the chair in use, this portrait of Newport citizen John Bores by John Singleton Copley in the collection of the Worcester Art Museum. This gave me a look of how somebody actually sat in the chair. It's pretty informal as he slouches down, leaning back on the crest and armrest. He sits to one side and does not straddle the center leg. He's portrayed with a book, and is drawing attention to his head or mind with his other hand, suggesting he is an intellectual and thinks deep thoughts. Interesting to me was that this man seemed comfortable. 
not uncomfortable as I imagined I would be. So here at least, a roundabout chair is used by a man, casually, while reading or thinking. I also learned that period terms and inventories and other documents call these chairs roundabout chairs, but also corner chairs, smoking chairs, writing chairs, and barber chairs. The, la the latter three images suggest an activity that it was associated with. Notably, these activities were primarily male activities, smoking, barber. So I was thinking that the roundabout chair was associated with men, which made a lot of sense since there was a, their, their shape and proportions would be difficult for a woman to gracefully sit in. Lastly, and most importantly, I learned due to their comfort, broad arms, and sturdy qualities, roundabout chairs were often used as commode chairs or closed stools meaning that corner chairs were often fitted with a ledge to suspend a removable chamber pot and used in bedrooms at night. So these extra strips of wood on the ledge that I couldn't figure out suddenly made a lot of sense. They supported a board with a hole cut out of it that held a chamber pot by its thick rim up top, as seen here. And those deep rails, which I thought looked out of proportion, they were extended on this particular chair to hide that chamber pot that was suspended behind them. And the evidence of different upholstery on the slip seat, it was probably originally a leather slip seat. Leather was more commonly used on these seats with commode modifications since it was easier to clean and didn't stain. Ew. I had this realization that I'd been climbing underneath this thing and my hands all over it and suddenly, oh, that's disgusting. But that's really, really cool. And that's when I was hooked. I was hooked on studying objects. I was hooked on how it made me think about the 18th century in a whole different way. I never thought about how people went to the bathroom before. I never thought about how this was dealt with in that society and how that would change the way people lived in many ways. I got really, really interested. So that's how my love of objects got started, underneath a potty chair, and I love the surprise. It made me start wondering about personal hygiene in the colonial era and concepts of modesty and cleanliness. This one chair got me thinking about colonial times in a whole nother way. As you can see from this silver chamber pot that I used in the slide, this is not an, just an Anglo-American custom but one that spans many cultures. This is a Bolivian chamber pot made about 1850. Seems kind of fancy to be using silver for such a purpose, but remember that great, the great silver mines were based in Bolivia, so silver was much more plentiful in the region where this was made. And it wasn't going to break as easily as you take the chamber pot outside to empty its contents if you dropped it. So chamber pots, I got really into it. I was going to write my master's thesis on this when I went to graduate school until my, master, my uh, advisor turned to me and said, I don't know how else to say this to you, Noni, but if you do this, you'll become known as the poop lady. <laughs> and I really don't think that's how you want to start your career. And she's probably right, but I still love the story and I still love thinking about these ideas. So let's take the, what we've learned here and apply it to another medium, this time to silver. We won't go through the whole material culture methodology again, but I will share what doing so can teach you about this object, and more importantly, about the culture that it came out of. This elaborately decorated silver box is oval and stands on four legs. It's quite large and took lots of silver and even more labor to create it. It's very highly decorated, meaning it was expensive. It has a long inscription on the underside, which shows that it was a family heirloom passed from generation to generation. There's references in various uh, documents of the period, particularly in the um, there's a sugar bowl in the Yale collection that was owned by the silversmith, Edward Winslow, and is referred to in his 
uh, in his inventory, his 1770, 1770 inventory, as a sugar box. Other references call these trunks of, of sugar. Okay, so here we have a sugar box. What, what else do we see about this piece? Whoop. We certainly, uh, we certainly wanted to keep, uh, let's go first to what is sugar? Why was sugar so important that you needed a fancy silver box for it? Sugar was a high cost luxury item. Originally used as a spice on meats and then became even more popular when it was added to the newly popular drinks of the 18th century of coffee, tea, and chocolate. It originated in India um, and then sugarcane spread to the West Indies, or the Caribbean, in the 16th century, as its tropical climate was good for its cultivation, and the slave labor system introduced by the colonists allowed for mass production. As refining technology improved, the cost of sugar declined. Sugar was believed to have special powers in the 17th and 18th century, particularly regarding fertility. One quote of the era reads, sugar, used in a proper manner, nourishes the body, generates good blood, cherishes the spirits, makes people prolific, and strengthens children in the womb. I knew I loved sugar. <laughs> sugar was recommended for infants, but also thought to calm strained tempers. That always works for me. It was thought to be restorative for the sick and to keep people from getting intoxicated by alcohol. Well, they didn't get that one right. So sugar has the, all of these very important associations. It was also very expensive. So to put it in a, such a fancy piece of silver makes a lot of sense. And then you notice it has a lock on it. And the woman of the household would be the only person to have the key. It denotes how precious this was, that nobody could pinch a little bit of sugar, um, and to keep this as safe as possible. But back to that idea of sugar making you fertile. This association may help to explain the shape of this piece, which is related to Italian cassone, or wedding chess of the 16th century. You can see a comparison. That sort of lobed center uh, bottom uh, section with a lid. I, I can see the connection. It's a, it's a little far flung, but I can see the, the, what, what some uh, people have argued for this. The snake on the top of the lid is thought to be an allusion to the Garden of Eden and the role of the snake and a 17th century emblem in which it says, warning the family not to meddle in the strife, a twix, a rising twix, a husband and wife. So this might be a, a very uh, sort of cautionary tale to those going for the sugar box to make sure that you maintain your um, good relations between your husband and your wife. So it makes you think of the sugar box in a really different way. The importance of sugar, the fact that you had to keep it under lock and key, that you had the fanciest item that you could find in a home might have been this sugar box. There are 10 known to survive in colonial America, and we are lucky enough to have three of them in the MFA collection. They're all on view in level um, LG, the le lower gal gallery level in the Art of the Americas wing, and they're really quite spectacular. If you go, to, go see them, notice their similarities. Notice their differences. Uh, they're made, two are made by John Coney, one by Edward Winslow. In the case next to it, you have three pots that are all made for drinking chocolate. Uh, both of these things were highly sought after expensive luxury goods. That's why there were silver used and the highest level of um, expense, really, but also prestige given used to, co to consume these works. So let's move on to two examples of study, uh, object studies that can offer us new views on the American Revolution. First, we will follow the material culture practice and start with an object and see what stories it can tell us. 
Um, and that will, we will start with this porcelain fruit basket made in Philadelphia just before the revolution in 1771. In looking at this object, the analysis of the object, we should see that it has a white clay body, which suggests that it's porcelain. And when I show you the underside of this, you'll see, I'll point out the areas where you can actually see the clay body itself, not the glaze that's on top of the body that could be masking its color. It has a white and blue uh, sort of look to it that's a, that seems to be more of a, a Chinese style. It has these pierced or cut out decorations in the side walls, suggestive about its use. It's not gonna be holding liquids, it's going to be holding solids. And here you can see on the, on the foot rim, the white body. Yes, it has gotten a little dirty over time with use, but you cannot glaze an entire piece. You're always, because you'll, it'll stick in the kiln. You either have to have it up on little stilts, often called kiln furniture, and you'll see the little dots where the stilts were, and you'll see the exposed clay body underneath it, or you clear, you clean the foot rim off of glaze, because otherwise you'll never be able to move the piece once uh, the glaze hardens. So you'll always be able to see the clay body somehow. This too had a label with an inscription that read, handed down from grandmother Gardner's family, presumably from the Whitehead family. Another family heirloom deemed worthy of keeping. But why? There was also some sort of mark in the blue glaze on the base. Is it an N and a two? Maybe an S or a squiggle? Not sure. This piece doesn't seem exquisitely made. It's kind of clumsy and a little sloppy in execution. The holes, the cuts aren't always even. The openings are of different dimensions. It seems to be sagging a little bit in certain areas. And, but, and, to, and maybe this was necessary for construction, maybe it wasn't, these applied exterior rosettes, was that to try to keep these air, this uh, pierced walls together? The central design on the interior is not always crisp and runs around the edges. Particular, and the rest of the blue glaze in other areas appears less sophisticated in detail. What was so important about this piece that it was saved for generations and now sits in a museum collection? First, let's look at the decoration. This decoration is a, a, mo a method called transfer printing. And transfer printing is when, this is a, a completely separate piece, but when a engraved copper plate or roll, in this case, has a scene on it, that is printed onto a piece of paper. And that paper is then, while still wet, transferred onto the ceramic. So that the ink from the paper is transferred onto the ceramic and leaves the reverse impression on the ceramic. So you can see this piece of paper has to go onto the, onto, um, the piece. And then you'll glaze over it to protect that, um, that design with a clear glaze. So it makes sense now when you're looking at this that when they put this design in, they put that piece of paper in, yet they hadn't account, whoop, they had accounted for the curving edges. Their design was a little bit too big for their piece, so it sort of ran down the sides. They sort of inched it up on the sides and it sort of was a little wobbly in the process, which suggests they weren't the most skilled of, ma of makers. Seems a little sloppy, a lack of experience to be running the images in the corners. Since we knew the white body meant that the piece was porcelain, but in, despite the white and blue color scheme, the transfer printed floral decoration suggested it was definitely not Chinese. This was not a practice that the Chinese were doing. So perhaps it's British porcelain. Can we find related examples? Right here in the MFA collection, we can find this Worcester uh, basket I'm sorry it's not a, black, a, blue, a color image, but this is another blue and white with a very similar design on the interior. But even in this poor image, you can see that it's much more detailed and sophisticated on the designs on the edges. 
you don't have the running as it comes to the edges on this piece. And the Worcester porcelain manufacturing and all the British porcelain manufacturers at this time were much more regular and even in their piercing designs as you're creating here. Uh, it seems to be have a higher degree of sophistication and finish. Also, the painted mark on the Worcester pieces is a blue crescent that is on this piece. And the mark in the bottom of our basket is certainly not a crescent. So if it's not English, and, and I can't identify that mark at all, where else could I look? And here's a comparison between the two. Sorry, I didn't have this up earlier, but this sort of naive design versus this more articulated design, and the comparison between the two um, executions, I should say. So you, find, I, you can find two other examples of this closely related to, in design and execution by the American China Manufactory in Philadelphia. This seems to fit the ticket. So let's le learn a little bit more about the American China Manufactory. There are 19 pieces known to survive from this porcelain factory, which was active in Philadelphia for two years, from 1770 to 1772. Majority of those 19 pieces are in museum collections, such as these two. Some show the most sophisticated designs, such as this reticulated basket or the pickle stand. Three pickle stands survive. Seven of the open work baskets, such as ours, survive. This factory was founded by Goose Bonin, a recent immigrant from England, and George Anthony Morris, a native Philadelphia with strong Quaker roots in the city. Both men were in their late 20s. They announced in a newspaper ads in the Philadelphia papers on December 25th, Christmas Day, 1769, that they have, quote, proven to a certainty that the clays of America are productive of good porcelain as any heretofore manufactured in the famous factory in Bow near London. And that they, quote, propose going largely into this manufacture as soon as the works, meaning the buildings, are complete. So in a city that was founded just 90 years earlier, they set out about setting up a factory in the growing Southwark section of Philadelphia. Philadelphia was starting to expand out of its original grid boundaries. You can see the actual building of the American China Manufactory on the 1796 map here. In order to prepare for making this porcelain, they had to outfit the building, they had to build the building, outfit it with equipment, and most importantly, they needed to recruit skilled European craftsmen to run the factory. There weren't any other ceramics manufactories, and definitely no porcelain manufactories active in the American colonies at this time. Nobody, there was nobody who, around who knew how to do this. So they needed to recruit people over from England. This notice in the Dublin Public Register shows that several of the craftsmen were recruited away from the Bow China Manufactory, the very factory that the uh, Bonin and Morris had proclaimed that they could do better than in their, in their advertisement. And it reads, the head and most ingenious painter belonging to the Bow factor, China Factory, whose name is Fry, Thomas Fry, and about a dozen of their uh, primest hands in the several branches have been privately engaged at a large consideration, meaning they paid them a lot of money, to establish a similar manufactory in Philadelphia. And they are immediately going over there, which has greatly di uh, distressed the proprietors at Bow. So this was a major undertaking. This was a huge capital investment. Oh, golly, sorry, I just sounded like Trump. Huge, um, <laughs> huge capital investment. and. Uh, so this, this was no small undertaking of young Goose Bonin and George Anthony Morris. In that fast 13-month timeline, they went from conception to production. 13 months is a pretty fast time, especially in the colonies at this time. And they announced their first successful production in January of 1771. And this was even reported in British newspapers. In a British paper was written, by a letter late from Philadelphia, we are informed that a large China manufactory is established there 
and that better china cups and saucers are made there than at Bow or Stratford. Them's fighting words. I mean, that, that's saying we can make better than you, mother country. We can, we can do this. We don't need your imports. Many prominent Philadelphians ordered the porcelain, and Benjamin Franklin's wife, Deborah, even sent him a pair of sauce boats while he was living in London. He responded to her, writing, I thank you for the sauce boats, and I'm pleased to find so good a progress made at the China manufactory. I wish it success most heartily. Yet despite the success and attention, the manufactory was constantly struggled for money, fell into bankruptcy, and closed within two years. What happened? And what does this teach us about the American Revolution? The story of the American China manufactory of Goose Bonin and George Anthony Morris teaches us about the growing desire of colonial Americans to gain their independence from Britain. The China manufactory is a perfect example of this struggle and how it wasn't an easy road. Much of this desire to, to be separate and to have be independent and create these factories stemmed from the increasingly strict British laws on American trade and manufacturing. Early on in 1651, the Navigation Acts banned foreign ships from transporting goods from outside Europe to England or its colonies. All goods coming, coming to and going from the colonies had to be English ships or colonial ships. In 1660, they added that all commodities, tobacco, sugar, cotton, wool, from the colonies could only be shipped to England. They couldn't trade with other countries. In 1663, we're still talking 100 years before the revolution, all European goods bound for the colonies must first be shipped to England, taxed, and then onto the colonies, making that the, the price even higher. In addition, there were laws against manufacturing. They wanted to keep manufacturing in England. The colony's purpose was to have raw materials. They were supposed to supply the tobacco, the lumber, the beaver pelts, and so forth. Britain had the factories to manufacture that. They didn't want the American colonies to create new factories to compete with them. Their purpose was to provide the raw materials, manufacture it, and then sell it back to them for more money. But then came the Townsend Acts of 1767. The British gov government needed money due to the large expenditures of the French and Indian War of the, of the decade before. And it decided since the wars were in the American colonies that they would levy the taxes on the American colonists, particularly on imported goods, including paper, painter's colors, paint, glass, lead, tea, and ceramics. They were saying that this was to pay for the border patrols to keep the colonists safe, but then they changed it that it would pay for the government officials' salaries before the colonists had paid the government official salaries. Now the salaries were coming from the, the British government and on the, from these taxes, making the, the colonial government officials more tied to their, their um, bosses in London. We all know the story, this didn't go over well, these, these, ta these new taxes, and inspired non-importation agreements uh, first in Boston in October of 67, that same year, and by the spring of 1768, all the colonies had adopted similar policies and agreed to boycott British goods to protest the taxation without representation in, British par in the British Parliament. And instead, they decided to promote American manufacturing. The boycott was particularly successful in Philadelphia, and the city's patriotic leaders were encouraging new businesses very rapidly. Patriot Benjamin Rush, who was away at medical school in Edinburgh, wrote to his friend Thomas Bradford in April 15, 1768, so shortly after the Townsend Acts were passed. And the best thing a historian can find is having when somebody goes away, because then they write letters home. And that's, that's, how, that's where we get this information. And he wrote, go on in encouraging manu American manufacturers. I have many schemes in view regarding, in regards to the, these things. I have made those mechanical arts which are connected with chemistry the particular objects of my study, and not without hopes of seeing a China manufactory established in Philadelphia in the course of a few years. 
Yes, we will be revenged of the mother country. For my part, I am resolved to devote my head, my heart, and my pen entirely to the service of America and promise myself much assistance from you in everything of this kind that I shall attempt through life. Russia's ideas reached a larger population a year later in January of 1769 when one of his letters was anonymously published in the Pennsylvania Journal, a newspaper. In this one, he wrote, there is but one expedient left where we can save our sinking country, and that is by encouraging American manufacturers. Unless we do this, we shall be undone forever. There is scarce a necessary article or even a luxury of life, but that might we be raised and brought to perfection in some of our provinces. And Rush wasn't the only Philadelphian who felt this way. The American Philosoph Philosophical Society, based in Philadelphia, with many prominent members, encouraged the establishment of new manufacturers and helped fund some as well. Bonin and Morris took advantage of that patriotic fervor when they announced their plans to create the porcelain factory in late 1769. But the cards were stacked against them. In March of 1770, the British government resigned, recognized that the British economy was losing too much money from the boycotts, and they repealed many of the taxes in the Townshend Act. Five months later, in August of 1770, they lifted, in particular, the import duties on china and earthenwares. This was even before Bonin and Morris had produced their first piece of porcelain. Although radical patriots tried to get colonists to continue their boycotts and support American manufacturing, the low prices of the imported wares were too tempting to many. Bonin and Morris continued with their quest and successfully produced porcelain, but their enormous setup costs, the building, the equipment, and especially the imported skilled craftsmen, proved way too much for them to overcome. They, Bonin and Morris pleaded with the colonial Pennsylvania government for financial assistance, but to no avail. In late 1771, they appealed to the Patriots with a lottery to help fund their financial, to build their reserves. But even that didn't sustain them. The lack of active colonial protest in 1771 and 1772 hurt the prospects of the American China manufactory and eventually led to its collapse. It wasn't until 1773 that new taxes sparked new patriot, patriotic fear, fear fervor and eventually led to a revolution. So this is an aspect we always think about. There, the, there was a historian um, who gave a lecture this past Sunday here, Jane Kaminsky, and I highly recommend her book on Copley that has just come out. But one of her um, strong points was that the road to revolution wasn't a constant push. It was really up and down. And the American China manufacturing, this object, this somewhat clumsy but really important object that embodies an American desire to be independent from Britain and trying to make their own uh, manufactured goods, shows that when patriotic fervor went down, we weren't expecting that in, seven, in early 1770. You, you think that it started with the Stamp Act and just kept on going, but it was much more of an up and down struggle. So on to our last uh, study. This time, let's start from an event and look how objects that might, how that might, the objects might help us understand the event a little bit better. How many of you have heard of the Boston Tea Party? I suspect most of you. How many of you know what happened? Okay, well most of the people know that on December 16th, 1773, a bunch of crazy colonists were angry about taxes, stormed some ships in Boston Harbor, and dumped the tea on the ships into the harbor. This made Britain, the British government very angry. They clamped down on the colonists and it all eventually led to the American Revolution. Quick sum. So what? Why was this a big deal? They threw some Lipton into the tea, into the water. Actually, it was Bohia, but it was tea. Why did they bother doing this 
And why did it cause such an uproar? What was it about the tea that got people so worked up? Let's see if we can dig a little bit further into the causes and significance of the Boston Tea Party by learning a little bit more about the significance of tea to British and colonial American culture. First, a quick recap of the events that led up to that fateful night in December of 1773. We just discussed the Townsend Acts of 1767, which levied import duties on a series of commodities, including paper, paint colors, glass, lead, and tea. For the first time, the colonial governments with Boston in the lead, worked together to protest these taxes by passing the non-importation agreements and by boycotting your, uh, English goods. This anti-government agitation greatly concerned the British crown. This image by Paul Revere in 1768 shows the landing of British troops in Boston that were to quell the rebellious Americans in, response to the Townsend, in their response to the Townsend Acts. I won't go that much further into the role of Boston and the Townsend Acts in 1768, because you'll be hearing plenty of that next week in Jerry Ward's lecture about the Liberty Bowl. But by 1770, the Townsend Acts were repealed, except for tea, which Prime Minister Lord North kept that tax, asserting to make sure to assert that he had the right to tax the Americans. Now the taxes on tea were more complicated and more of a thorny issue. And they had been for quite some time. The importation of tea, the rights of the East India Company, and the taxing of tea had been a controversial in, uh, issue for a long time, really since 1698, when the East India Company was given a monopoly on importing tea into England. Now, over 70 years later, within the milieu of all these other taxes and the colonists' concerns over taxation without representation, it was coming to a head. There was a reason why Lord North chose tea as, as a tax to maintain. Tea was symbolic. Tea was not just a beverage in the 18th century British world. Tea was a way of life. For their family portrait, this identified English family chose to be t depicted drinking tea. They didn't choose to be shown eating dinner or playing cards. They specifically chose tea drinking, and they were far from the only ones. Tea drinking signified a level of, level of wealth, refinement, and sophistication. The introduction of tea in the late 17th century was not only, influ not only influenced people's drinking habits, but their material possessions, their self-identification, their behavior, and their modes of social interaction. By 1773, tea was an integral part of British life. Let me explain a little bit further. Starting in the 17th century, imported Asian tea, usually from China, became popular and sought after. The high price of this imported tea meant that it was originally only available to the elite. But with increased trade, and the availability of tea in the early 18th century became larger, and the demand for it skyrocketed, making, it making the commodity of tea to dominate the China trade. And as tea, became, tea drinking became a practice of more and more people, it revolutionized habits of social interaction, from royal courts to colonial homes. Afternoon and evening tea parties were the latest type of social gathering that brought men and women together in an informal setting, leading to spirited conversation, much gossip, and occasionally a little flirting. Despite this air of informality, tea drinking developed strict rules of tea table decorum, unspoken yet socially important rules of gentility, such as how to properly hold a teacup. This became a signifier of your social graces and your sophistication. Demonstrating wealth, domesticity, and genteel informality, tea drinking came to epitomize civilized behavior in the 18th century. Tea also gave women a new position of power, as they were the ones to serve the tea and direct the conversation. In this painting of another unknown English family, you can see the tea box in the foreground 
just at her feet. Its contents were usually kept under lock and key, like the sugar we saw earlier. But here you can see her carefully doling out the precious leaves from a container. To properly serve tea, one also had to own all of the items related to its consumption, as seen on the various tea tables we have seen in the paintings. Of course, you needed a teapot. This silver example was made around 1770 by the patriot Paul Revere here in Boston, and it's much like the one he chose to be depicted with in his own portrait by John Singleton Copley, painted in 1768. It's what we call a double-bellied form, meaning it has one belly, two belly, sort of double chin, double-bellied form. A C-scroll handle, an S-curve spout, and an acorn finial. It was the fashionable Rococo style of the pre-revolutionary era. But teapots didn't have to be silver. They were often made in ceramic as well, either earthenware, stoneware, or the most expensive porcelain. They could have been imported from China, very fitting with the imported Chinese tea, or made in England or Europe, such as the ones you see here in a range of different shapes and decorative styles. In addition to a teapot, to suit your style, you needed teacups and tea saucers. Again, these could have been imported Chinese porcelain, such as the ones we presume to be imported Chinese porcelain in this uh, uh, pa painting here. These were often not called tea cups at the time, but tea bowls. Or they could have been English soft paste porcelain or imitation porcelain, such as this set made at the Worcester porcelain manufacturer in England. You also needed a sugar bowl, preferably one with a lid to protect the precious imported silver that we learned about earlier, and a creamer, which e either of which these two could be ceramic or silver. You needed at least one teaspoon, but preferably a set so each tea drinker could have their own, as well as sugar tongs to keep your dirty teaspoon so it didn't contaminate the sugar in the bowl. You needed a tea strainer spoon to get uh, that with the pierced bowl of the spoon so you could fish out any errant tea leaves in your cup. And of course, you needed a tray to carry it all to the table, and more importantly, to protect your wooden tabletop from the hot containers or the drips. If you were really cool, you had a silver tea kettle outfitted with a burner like this one to keep the hot water hot. But the kettle didn't have to be silver, as in this painting you can see the servant holding a copper kettle, but silver was all the more impressive. Then of course you needed a tea table to hold all of these objects and to gather around. It could be round like this one with a central post that, and a top that lifts, lifts vertically so you could push it against into a corner and display it and have it get out of the way from the middle of the room. Or it could have been rectangular, like this one from Boston, seen here fully fitted out. Note how the teacups and saucers are perfectly fitted in the round turrets that decorate the top of the table. Tea was expensive, but proper tea drinking was even more expensive. You needed an enormous number of objects for this specific activity. It was really the first time in British Anglo-American history that one social activity demanded the acquisition of so many specialized material goods. So with this information, seeing the integral role of tea in social interaction and the enormous investment people made to properly drink tea, and the status that tea had in society, the Boston Tea Party starts to make a lot more sense. So let's return to 1773 in Boston. In 1773, Parliament passed the Tea Act, yet again confirming that same additional tax from the Townsend, Townsend Act on imported tea to the colonies, but was now giving the struggling East India Company the right to control all shipping of tea to England to the colonies and confining the sale of tea within the colonies to only government-approved consignees. This hit an already sore spot with the colonists and set off another firestorm. The Tea Act was passed on May 10, 1773, but Americans did not learn about it until seven ships full of tea cargo were already on their way to the colonies, one to New York, one to Philadelphia, one to Charleston, 
and four to Boston. Other colonies protested peacefully, but refused to allow the East India ships to unload their cargo of tea, forcing them to return to England. In Boston, things got a, lot more, a little bit more contentious. The rabble-rousers had worked many up into a lather about the tyranny of the British government in imposing taxes on the colonies without giving them representation in Parliament, and now they were giving the East India Company monopolies on tea. What was next? The cargoes of tea, of tea that arrived in Boston Harbor in late November 1773 symbolized this tyranny. Boston's recalcitrant governor, Thomas Hutchinson, refused to allow the ships to leave the harbor without paying import duties, and the colonists refused to allow the tea to be unloaded. So on December 16, 1773, an angry mob of colonists, some dressed as, in disguise as Native American Mohawk warriors, and all disguising their faces, boarded the three ships in Boston Harbor and dumped all 342 chests of tea into the water, costing approximately 9,000 pounds, which, which amounts to about $1 million today. Later, one of the tea partiers, George Hughes, recalled, we were then ordered by our commander to open the hatches and take out all of the chests of tea and throw them overboard. And we immediately proceeded to execute his orders, first cutting and splitting the chests with our tomahawks so as to thoroughly expose them to the effects of the water. In about three hours from the time we went on board, we had thus broken and thrown overboard every tea chest to be found in the ship, while those in the other ships were disposing of the tea in the same way at the same time. We were surrounded by British armed ships, but no attempt was made to resist us. Needless to say, the British government was not happy. They considered this the unlawful destruction of private property and swore to prosecute those involved. The Patriots, on the other hand, were elated. John Adams, who had not been in Boston at the time of the Tea Party, learned of it quickly and wrote that evening, this is the most magnificent movement of all. There is a dignity, a majesty, a sublimity in this last effort of the Patriots I greatly admire. The people should never rise without doing something to be remembered, something notable and striking. This destruction of the tea is so bold, so daring, so firm, intrepid and inflexible that it must have so important consequences and so lasting that I cannot but consider it as an apaca in history. Pretty flowery and pretty bold. He's clearly so excited. He goes on to, to talk about how some, we, we must be careful, however, because this is an attack upon pop, property. Another, an, another similar exertion of popular power may produce the destruction of lives. Many persons wish that as many dead carcasses were floating in the harbor as there are chests of tea. A much less number of lives, however, would remove the causes of all our calamities. He later writes the next night to his friend James Warren, another patriot, the die is cast. The people have passed the river and cut away the bridge. Last night, three cargoes of tea were emptied into the harbor. This is the grandest event which has ever yet happened since the controversy with Brit Britain opened. The sublimity of it charms me. A little less flowery, but no less determined, John Hancock wrote a few days later on December 21st, 1773. We have been much agitated in consequence of the arrival of tea ships by the East India Company, and after every effort was made to induce the consignees to return it from whence it came, and all proving ineffectual, in a very few hours, the whole of the tea on board was thrown into the salt water. No one circumstance could possibly have taken place more effectively to unite the colonies than this maneuver of the tea. In response to the Boston Tea Party, the colonial British government closed the port of Boston and enacted a series of new laws that became known as the Coercive Acts. When leaders in England heard about it, they passed what became known as the Intolerable Acts that punished not just Massachusetts, but other colonies as well. <clears throat> 
Colonial reaction to the Intolerable Acts prompted the calling of the First Continental Congress in September of 1774. And we all know what happened from there. Sort of makes you look at this teapot a little differently now, doesn't it? Thank you. Now I'm happy to take questions. We have some time for it. Um, I think Kristen might be in with a minute with, um, with microphones, but if you can speak loudly, I'm happy to st start off before she can get here. Yes? Uh, considering the trade policies that Great Britain is imposing on the colonies, how active and how big is the black Ah, the question is, well, how active was the black market given these taxes? And that is something I did not address. And yes, that was definitely an issue because the British, East, the British government highly taxed the East India Company. And one of the reasons the East India Company was starting to fail and why they decided to give East India Company all of this monopoly on the colonies was that because of the taxes that, that was being leveled on the, English East, the British East India Company, Dutch tea was being sold for a lot less because the Dutch government wasn't taxing the Dutch East India Company. So Dutch tea was the smuggled tea. And was uh, while British tea at the time was three shillings, the equivalent of Dutch tea was uh, two shillings, one pence. So it was a pretty big difference. And so there was, and then there was also some tea starting to be grown in Labrador up towards Nova Scotia. Um, but the other, there was much more smuggled tea into Charleston, Philadelphia, New York. Boston had a lot more trouble with the smuggling. The British government was much stronger in Boston. And therefore, there, mo most of what Boston was doing was paying up for the legal tea. So when they stopped, when they stopped drinking it, thus saying, I am not going to use all these fancy, expensive things I have in my home. I am not going to have my usual modes of interaction with people, but the tea party and so forth. They really meant it. Yeah, if you could wait just one second, I think Lauren's going to come racing over with a microphone. You talked about the tea party in the family as being a time for casual social interaction. Mm -hmm. In two of those depictions of families, the men are wearing very casual clothes. Mm -hmm. They're wearing a kind of specialized garment, uh, like a Turkish robe and um, a turban that would have covered probably their shaved heads rather than wearing wigs. Do you want to talk about that a little sure. bit? Sure. You'll recognize a very similar outfit on this guy to one of our Copley portraits. Uh, Nicholas Boylston? Do we know Nicholas? There's another Boylston brother that is uh, at, in the Harvard collection. I can never remember which one we have. Um, wearing the same banyan coat made out of imported silk, and banyans were uh, sort of... Uh, mimicked after Asian, really Indian style garments, um, and wearing the sort of floppy silk head uh, cover to, uh, or head cover to, instead of a wig, because they have a shaved head, uh, as you said. And yes, this was definitely an informal costume. One, it was showing the well, uh, just like Nicholson, Nicholas Boylston chose by Copley to be portrayed this way, it was showing his wealth of having all these imported silks and having the latest styles. But it also, to be able to have leisure time, you needed, you were wealthy. And so that was, that was showing off as well, that you had the wherewithal to buy clothes for leisure, not just clothes for work and for, uh, for formal wear. And so tea was, Tea was used in all sorts of different manners. When we say the term tea party nowadays, there were a lot of different tea parties. There was the informal family tea party. I mean, here's one just eating a biscuit down here. And that, that kid's just sort of drinking their own tea. This is a very informal setting, which you think, and if you look at the date, that's 1725. So the, the tea is really credited with giving family uh, just not just family, but also men and women in social settings, a more informal way of interacting, that it wasn't a ball 
where you had your steps and your reel that you had to follow and, that, and everything was very prescribed. This was much more um, informal and their clothing also portrays that. So that gives that same concept, that refined gentility. Does that answer your question? Okay, great. Yeah. So to continue to follow up on tea, when did drinking of tea come back in? <laughs> and then has it? And then <laughs> and then when? Um, because it certainly continued on. I mean, women. Uh, MFA associates were pouring tea until not too mm -hmm. long ago. So um, when did it come back in? It created, a, again, a great height, and there were tea caddies, I think, you know. Um, yeah, I didn't get into all of the material goods. There were plenty of material goods. Tea caddies where you kept your tea leaves and, and so forth. Uh, when did, so after the Revolutionary War, tea became so symbolic and so tied up with Britain that they had done these boycotts that tea they still, tea went down in favor after, we, um, after the Revolutionary War. And Americans started drinking more coffee. And we really haven't looked back. Um, tea is, you know, now, when I'm talking about this with um, college students or so forth, I say, imagine taking the tea out of their world. Imagine taking coffee out of our world. No Starbucks, no other cafes, nobody walking around with a, cup in their hand. Nobody saying, let's meet up for coffee. This, was a, this is a major part of our, our, our culture. And tea maintained that aristocratic British notion. And so in certain levels of, of society, and I would put the Ladies Association here at the MFA in there, it was a refined, genteel thing to do in the MFA. I'm not knocking it. I thought it was pretty great. I, I miss it. Uh, I, thought, I thought it was, uh, it was a lovely, very civilized thing to do. All of our uh, staff who are from other countries stop sort of at 3 o'clock every day and have tea. And, oh, isn't that lovely? And they actually talk about things. Um, that, that's, that's wonderful. But I still think it only remains very popular in a certain higher level of society. I could be argued with, but I think coffee is more democratic. And I think Starbucks needs to pay me a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, how is tea drink? Uh, what was uh, tea drink drunk in the, uh, by itself? Or my mother was from England, and we always drank tea with milk. Mm -hmm. um, and, and and people come from other countries always had tea with lemon or sugar? Yes, well, what we know is from the material artifacts that survive. So what we know is that there were sugar bowls and there were creamers with milk in them. Um, it's a little harder to get to the fact whether there were lemons, doubtful, because yeah. lemons were a imported good. They were quite rare. Um, they weren't being grown in Boston, um, and they weren't really being grown in the American colonies. So it's uh, the it was most like it was most likely it was as you wished, but it, I don't know if there was a prescribed mode of it or not. I would have to do more research. I suspect there's something written somewhere in somebody's diary about how they took tea, um, but it could also have been a personal preference. Uh, it wouldn't be used with lemon because that would just curd the the milk. <laughs> yes, no, you wouldn't put them both together, but I don't know if lemons were necessarily an option at that time. And when did, um, uh, these are bowls, the, the teacups here are bowls. When did the... The handles, uh, yeah, handles. the handles started becoming more um, regular, I should say, um, in sort of the mid, the second third, second third of the 18th century. Uh, is when you start seeing more handles. And you don't see them in China um, unless they're made specifically for the export market. This is a Western thing as to have the tea bowls. And you notice they're a lot smaller than what we use these days. They're tiny. Tea was precious. You doled it out carefully. But also, you, the way they're holding it on the, the rim and the, the foot, that's so it wouldn't hurt. You weren't, it wasn't too hot. Um, and so these were small enough so you could hold it this way 
So you can drink without, if you, you could still have your tea quite hot without a, a burning your hand. Hi, I wanted to ask about the uh, Philadelphia um, American Porcelain Manufacturing. Were they actually making true porcelain, hard porcelain, or was it the soft paste porcelain? Yes, the American China Manufacturing was making uh, soft paste porcelain. And I said that very quickly and sort of didn't go into the difference between hard paste porcelain and soft paste porcelain which could take a dissertation to do so. Um, but hard paste porcelain, in general, is what was made in China. And that's what everybody was trying to mimic. Porcelain was introduced around to the West around the same time as tea and silk and uh, all these other commodities that became just the fad. They were the exotic, worldly goods that people needed to have to be able to show their wealth and sophistication. And porcelain was known for several things. It was extraordinarily thin compared to the earthenwares and stonewares made in the West. Um, it was much more durable. It didn't crack as, as easily. Um, and uh, interestingly, it was translucent when held up to light. You could see um, the light come through. Something that was important to the Chinese, but the West didn't seem to really care, is that it also was sonorous. If you, if you dinged it, it had a ringtone to it. Uh, that really never caught on as an issue that was something they tried to imitate in the West. Westerners, w Europeans, went bonkers trying to imitate porcelain and couldn't figure out the mysteries of porcelain. And went for, we're talking generations, and finally discovered that they didn't have the same raw materials that were available in China. Kaolin clay, in particular, was the material that made hard paste porcelain um, so Give it, give it all those properties. But that didn't keep them from trying. So alchemists were paid huge sums of money. Um, and the, the German king, somebody, Augustus the Strong, thank you, started the Meissen porcelain factory. And the rumor is that he held a, a, an alchemist in, you know, in prison, basically, for years until he came up with porcelain, damn it. And so they, that, that um, man actually created hard paste, but the English created soft paste, which is an imitation that had several of these qualities, but it was a little bit more brittle, it could still be thin, and it was still translucent, but it was called soft paste porcelain. The only real way of telling the difference between soft paste and hard paste porcelain is seeing the grains in it, and that means you have to have a broken piece of porcelain. So that, that, that makes it a little hard, um, but uh, it's much more of a crisp, clean, glassy cut um, if it's hard paste porcelain, it's much more granular. It looks like sand on the inside if it's, hard, if it's soft paste porcelain. Basically, the American China manufacturer was stealing everything they could from Bo and with, when bringing over these various porcelain manufacturers. So they were taking the same recipes for um, porcelain from them as well. Long answer to your question. Um, the sugar, going back to the sugar box, um, this is a two-part question. Uh, was that sugar box made in the colonies or was it made in England or where was it made? And that's the first part. And the second part is, uh, could you ruminate a little bit on how the Puritans, you know, those people who were, wore simple dresses and uh, had sumptuary laws, and uh, how they broke out into, you know, these luxury goods pretty fast, it seems fast. to me. But I want to know what you think. It's very true. Um, and that's very true. Two, two good questions. Um, the sugar box that you see here is American-made here in the colonies here in Boston by a silversmith named John Coney. Paul Revere gets most of the attention for being the most important silversmith before the American Revolution. I could argue that if Paul hadn't ridden a horse, he would still be very important. But John Coney was the most influential silversmith of the colonial era. Um, Coney brought some of the latest, always brought the latest designs to the American colonies. Um, and so they were creating these. These are created, they, they thought of themselves as British servants, uh, subjects. They were mimicking exactly what that was being created and uh, over in England. And they were, so they were either learning that through 
imported craftsmen who were coming over with those designs in their heads or imported objects, and they were imitating those objects. But uh, this, this piece, this very snazzy piece, was made in the colonies, in Boston, in Puritan country. Um, and you sort of think, whoa, um, what's, what's up with this, you know, the, the Puritans being uh, very much saying we don't do frilly, we don't do ornamentation, we don't do outward shows of um, ostentation, yet they did. Um, and they did from the start. Uh, they might have been a little bit more circumspect in it than, say, the Roman Catholic Church um, in, their, in the sense that if you look at the church silver, the silver that was used in American churches that's on the lower ground level of the Art of the Americas wing, they are all domestic forms. So instead of using monstrances and chalices and great big showy pieces, they used tankards and caudal cups and so forth. So that was their way. But it was still silver. It was still really expensive. So it was a, more of a understated um, gentility in that way. They were trying to see what they were comparing themselves to. But they wore their lace which was quite expensive. They, they wore, a, a, there was, and they had a lot of color in their home. Um, the 19th century, create, 19th century America created our history of the United States. They wrote our history of the United States and very much put a, took all the color out of it in many ways. We think, I think of the Puritans as black and white. They only wore black and white clothes. They lived in very sort of dull houses and so forth. But all of that furniture that we see downstairs was originally very bright. It was, most of it was made of oak, which means it was bright white and it had paint on it. So it was red, it was white and um, black, and then also had red paint on it or blue paint on it and green paint on it. This, the, there was a lot more color in their lives. So it's hard to rectify that with the sumptuary laws and so forth. Um, and I would say by the second, by the third generation, a lot of this was out, a lot of that was out the window. Um, you know, by, by 1720, we have um, card tables being created, yet we still had on the books no card playing allowed in the, in the colony, yet we have all the evidence that people were playing cards. So, you know, that's another thing, that's just showing you another thing, that objects can show you the undercurrent, not necessarily what's written in the law books, but how people actually lived. And this is the, one of the uh, 1720 card tables we have was owned by Peter Faneuil. He was a very well, Faneuil Hall, he was a very wealthy, prominent merchant. He wasn't, he, and he wasn't hiding, you know, his more cosmopolitan era. So uh, yes, there's two sides of history and we, we need to look at the physical evidence as well as the written evidence. Thank you, that made me feel, sound like I wrapped it all up. Thank you. <laughs> Great note to end. Thank you so much, Noni, and thank you, thank everyone, you. for coming today.